is I like to try and communicate science to the general public, to try and get people interested in science, or to try and get them excited about it. So I do talk about science on the radio, I talk about science at music festivals, I literally talk about science to anybody that will listen to me. And I like to talk about science that's in the everyday, and science kind of all of us can relate to. Um, I like to talk about the science of music, because I'm a musician, or I like to talk about topics such as the science of kissing. So today I want to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is sexy science. And uh, obviously from that murmur of appreciation, everyone agrees it's a very <laughs> sexy topic. <laughs> it was a very loud yes from the priest there in front. Um, <laughs> So hopefully if, if you didn't come here thinking science was sexy or thinking it was fun or that it could be a bit of crack, hopefully you'll think that it is by the time you leave. So I want to talk about love. Is anybody here in love? Show of hands, put your hands up. Okay. Keep them up for a wee second. Just so I can figure out who's single. Um, <laughs> so is anybody here? Anyone here? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I like to hope you are single. So, uh, anybody here in a couple? Any couples here? Is anyone here with their partner? Hands up. Those two? You two? That's really awkward because you didn't put your hand up whenever I asked him. Was <laughs> He's actually holding on to it, trying to force it up. You still won't put it up. Okay, so. You know, love is a very elusive thing, and Van Gogh once said, love is a mystery in a mystery. And I thought, that doesn't really mean anything, it just kind of sounds pretty. And I wanted to know what love was according to science, or what the facts behind love were. So there's a biological anthropologist called Helen Fisher who has split love into three very distinct stages. So I want to go through that journey with you all today. And we begin at stage one, which is lust. So at puberty, two sex hormones become active in the body. You've got your estrogen and your testosterone. And basically, from then on in, we're kind of constantly on the prowl for somebody to reproduce with, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And how, how do we entice people? How do we get them to like us? Well, as humans, we flirt. That's our kind of evolutionary adapted technique. We flirt. And one of the most important things, I think, with flirting is make your first impression or your first chat up line a really good one because it takes your brain less than a second to decide if you're going to fancy someone or not. And this was kind of my go-to chat up line. Um, <laughs> it, it doesn't really work because people just think you're calling them fat, so I wouldn't advise that one. Um, and us humans are pretty good if we're in that stage, stage one lust, with unrequited lust. We're quite good with unrequited lust, but animals aren't quite so good. So for example, if a flirty male wolf spider approaches an unwilling female, she doesn't just retreat, she actually eats him. So I think if you're on a night out in Thompson's and somebody says thanks, but no thanks, it's not actually that big a deal. Because um, it could be a lot worse. And that kind of got me onto the very unusual, I say, great topic of animals mating. Does anyone ever think about animals mating? No, not that you're going to admit. Um, so people often ask me, whenever I talk about science, do animals fall in love? You know, they're not as interested in the humans. What about the animals? Do they fall in love? And what do people here think? Do you think generally they do? Yeah. I think they've got very similar emotions to us, and they probably do fall in love. Um, and there's been research now to support that. But years ago, people just thought animals just meet and mate. And I thought that was a very sad thing to think. But I thought it would probably make a good song. Um, <laughs> So I thought I would write a song about animals who just meet and mate, and while they're doing that, they see humans on a date, and they think, why are you wasting all your time and resources <laughs> on dating and paying for dinner and everything else that comes along with it? Why don't you just be like us and just meet and mate? So I'm going to play two songs, and this is the first one. This is an animal love song. Can we hear that okay? Across the green, I'd never seen such a handsome beaver. 
You caught my eye with your healthy size and your toothy smile. I could tell that you were eager, so I walked right up and I sniffed your butt. And you smelled just like a tree. I knew you were the one for me. And you must have had a sexy mind because you sniffed me from behind. But this isn't art. It's not seduction. It's just simple reproduction. He said, oh, well, I could say that I love you. But I'm just following evolutionary trends She said, I could say that I need you But I just need you till this time of ovulation ends But, 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 fever love, my fever love, hey, hey But, 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 fever love, my fever love, hey, hey Please learn that because we're going to get you all to join in on the next, <laughs> on the next chorus then as we were mating, we saw two humans dating. They were kissing, holding hands, but both of them were wearing pants. And I could tell they were of age for fertilization of eggs. So why are they wasting all their time with dinner, nice kisses and wine? When they could be at it like the rabbits, they could rattle like the snakes, clean each other just like cats or use no hands like a T-Rex. They could be swinging like the monkeys, squealing like the pigs, or just doing it like those beavers on these leaves and worms and twigs. So humans, next time, just say, hey, I like your DNA. Do you want to set a dit to come over, procreate? <laughs> he said, oh, well, I could say that I love you, but I'm just following evolutionary trends. She said, I could say that I need you, but I just need you till this time of ovulation ends. But, 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 be realize my mum will um, kill me for singing that song she's such a fan girl over the priest and she's like a, a trained religion teacher and everything and she always tells me not to sing that anyway so this was a really bad move on my, <laughs> on my part. Um, so now that we know that we do flirt we need to figure out who are we going to flirt with or what are we attracted to. So one thing we're attracted to is the colour red. So millions of years ago our ancestors were able to see ripe red fruits among green leaves and from then on in our brains, red equaled reward, and that's been hardwired into us ever since. Big brands like TEDx and Coke and McDonald's all use red, and it can actually quicken the pulse, and if someone attractive is wearing red, it can actually cause mass feelings of excitement. Calm down, guys. <laughs> <laughs> something else that really kind of makes us interested in someone is something called the MHC genes. So these are a group of genes, and they build our immune system, but they also give us, you know, our natural scent. And there's a very famous experiment where women overwhelmingly prefer the smell of T-shirts worn by men who had different MHC genes to their own. And the reason for that is because if two people with two different sets of MHC genes come together to produce a child, that child is going to get the best of both worlds, so they're going to be able to better fight disease. So in terms of MHC genes, opposites really, really do attract. So that's our stage one, lust complete. And you move on to stage two, which is romantic attraction. So this is the stage where you are madly, madly in love, obsessed with someone. You can't stop thinking about them. You can't stop finding excuses to hang out with them. You can't stop talking about them, much to the annoyance of everybody else around you. Um, does anyone think they're in this stage, the kind of madly in love stage? Oh, you? Yes, with, is the person here? No, so they, they obviously are fine being apart from you. It's just, <laughs> okay, so this is a pretty nice stage to be in, isn't it? Yeah, what's your name? Okay, so you're enjoying the stage? Is it mutual? Okay, so that's good. So if it's mutual, it'll probably, it'll probably wear off in about three months. So just to let you know that. Um, so whenever you're in this stage, people associate love with the heart, but the real magic of love happens within the brain. And scientists put people who were like yourself, madly in love, into a big MRI scanner. 
and they saw that areas of the brain lit up. So one of the areas was an area called the caudate nucleus, and it's an area that helps us expect and detect rewards. So in this case, the reward for yourself would be love. Um, the second area is an area called the ventral tegmental area, so it acts like a chemical making factory. So it's like your own wee personal cupid, it makes up all these little love drugs and it shoots them out through your brains and your body. And this kind of cocktail of drugs is feel good hormones like dopamine, your serotonin levels are lowered, oxytocin, the love hormones in there, and it kind of makes you act out of control. It stimulates the same area of the brain as cocaine. It's unbelievable, isn't it? With similar side effects, like you've got increased heart rate, obsessive thoughts, and ultimately addiction. Um, so put simply, if you're at this stage in love, you're actually just chemically insane. <laughs> um, your brain obviously isn't able to survive in that state forever, which is why it wears off usually quite quickly. Um, is anyone here in a long-term relationship? Oh, that was the most unenthusiastic. <laughs> Me. Oh. Um, so these long-term relationships are some people who are married. You know, this is stage three, which is attachment. So your brain isn't able to survive in that kind of excited, you know, cocaine-like state forever. It has to sober up. So it's kind of taken over by these opiate-like pain-killing, dumbing chemicals, um, which kind of lull you into a sense of comfort and security. And in terms of evolution, that's to kind of keep you with someone long enough to raise a child safely through infancy. Um, and I thought I couldn't really talk about love without talking about how love has evolved through what I like to call digital dating, because it has changed quite a lot in recent years. Um, and it all started back with Match.com. Was anyone ever on this at the time? You? To the person from Match.com? Okay, it obviously works, doesn't it? So. Um, I wouldn't feel too special though, because look at the stats there, there's been quite a lot of marriages, 92,000, there's probably a lot more than that. Um, ha over half a million relationships and around a million babies, probably way more babies than that. They probably, you know, don't have track of all the ones that are from Match.com. Um, but everything kind of changed whenever Tinder came about in 2012. Anybody here on Tinder? Yeah, I'm sure, put up your hands. <laughs> Put up your hands if you're on Tinder, because it's highly unlikely that no one else would be in the room. And there was somebody when I was out getting sandwiches that I matched with on Tinder, so I'm pretty <laughs> sure... <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's more than just me. Um, so everything kind of changed um, whenever Tinder came about in 2012, and there's some fascinating facts about it. So I find it fascinating that we have Tinder in practically every single country in the world. But if you think about what some of our countries don't have, you know, like water, and they have Tinder. I just, that just kind of blows my mind a little bit. Um, there's been 20 billion matches since it, it's launched, which I find unbelievable. But one of the interesting stats about Tinder is that whenever women send their first message, it's usually around 122 characters, but the men's first message is usually around 12 characters. Um, so I don't know what they'd be saying that's so different, but there's quite an obvious gender difference with it. And as I was thinking about Tinder, I thought, um, it would be nice to have a kind of modern day love song. Um, and I thought because I've fallen in love so many times online um, that I would be a good person to write it. Uh, has anyone ever heard the phrase Insta Bay? Does anyone know what that means? No? Good, I can introduce it to you. So Insta Bay is when you fall in love with someone on Instagram um, and you just think they're perfect. You know, you've all the same interests, you're so obsessed with them, you're so into them. They looked amazing at their Auntie Sharon's wedding three years ago. Like, you just, you love them. You've never met them, you don't know who they are, but you're totally head over heels for them. Um, and this is something that happens quite a lot in modern day relationships. And if it's on Instagram, it's called hashtag InstaBay. So I thought, why not write a song? Um, so I hope everyone has enjoyed my talk on the science of love. I'm going to finish with hashtag InstaBay, and I hope some of the people in the room who are on Instagram can identify in some way with this. I'm just online, talking to people. I gets me some wine, and I'm stalking some people. I'm trying to find my InstaBay. Then I see a picture and I'm like, hashtag, hey. You like taking photos of yourself in the mirror, me too. You also like taking photos of your mediocre food. You even have pictures of you and your dog out on your bikes. I 
don't like dogs, but I could use them in my photo for likes. Then I see it, cue my heartbreak. This must be a mistake. Who the is she in your Instagram feed? No, it should be me. I've been 50 weeks deep in your photos for days. Maybe let's just get engaged. There's like 30 different ways for me to find your address. Snapchat Geo, tagging on. You thought you turned it off, but baby, baby, you was wrong. You Facebook checked in to your mama's house. Tell her from outside of her window that I like her blouse. That girl in your Instagram isn't half as pretty as me. Despite the fact she's an underwear model for Abercrombie and Fitch. What a witch, I'm guessing she's got no personality. And I don't care that her hair looks like it's from a net I saw on TV. How could you choose her? What a loser. This must be a mistake. Who the is she in your Instagram feed? No, it should be me. I've been 50 weeks deep in your photos for days. Baby, let's just get engaged. There's like 30 different ways for me to find your address. We could have been for real. Facebook relationship. Now my only commitment is eating this bargain. Buck up with a gravy chip. We could have Netflix and chilled. I've got a sofa bed. Now I'll just Netflix and fill myself with garlic bread. Who is she in your Instagram feed? No, it should be me. I've been 50 weeks deep in your photos for days. Baby, let's just get engaged. There's like 30 different ways for me to find your address. Now I've just noticed you've the same second name. You must have married her. My life will never be the same. How could you do this to us? Do you have no decency? My hashtag InstaBay has hashtag InstaBetrayed me. So I slide into your DMs, that's direct message, guys. And as I wait for your reply, tears are filling both my eyes. I wrote, I can't believe you married Kylie. Love her, held her, kissed her. You replied, I don't know who you are, but Kylie is my sister. <laughs> So it could be me in your Instagram feed, yeah, it should be, see, I've been 50 weeks deep in your photos for days, baby, let's just get engaged, there's like 30 different ways for me to find your address. Thank you, everybody, I'm Amy McGuire. Thank you.